I am vexed. Um, I've been sharing this with you for some time. I have a hunch this will be a steady diet off and on as time goes. In my spirit, <coughs> about um, the land in which we live and about the church and the way that it responds um, as we make our way um, living in our society and in our culture um, of today. I make it my business because my spirit is troubled deeply. I make it my business to try to interpret, interpret and translate what's going on and just keep an eye on it. I don't feel like uh, I want to give you a steady diet. I don't know that we could handle it. I do want to say to you today, as I get started, <coughs> that do not be discouraged by the low numbers. Do not be discouraged by um, some of the exiting. Uh, be encouraged. And I'm going to refer to this in my message as well, but I, I, I just I, I need to say it. Um, we're on the right track. We're listening to God, and God is up to something. Um, it doesn't have to be in great numbers. Um, I would remind you that Jesus said that uh, <clears throat> the way is actually narrow, and only a few on that road. Okay? Just, I think it's good to be reminded. Amen? Okay. Title of today's message is Lunch with Jesus. I have a hunch, I don't know, it could have been a dinner, as I deal with um, this, this gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter, I'm going to actually tell the story of uh, verses 1 through 24, and, and just want to refer to verse 23, um, the key there, that his master then told him, go out along the back roads and fence rows and make people come in so that my house will be full. find that interesting. Father, I just read the key. I ask your Holy Spirit's unctioning upon this service and upon this message and upon these lips. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Do you remember, you may not, may not remember the name, but you'll remember the company, I'm sure of it, uh, Dan Cathy, who is the proprietor of Chick-fil-A, and that he took a stand on marriage, and, the, and then the gay mafia targeted his business, asking people to boycott it. George Barna uh, was invited, actually, um, that same week by CNN to give a Christian perspective on the issue which he did, uh, he said, vigorously defended the biblical view of marriage and, and the biblical view of, of homosexuality uh, with the time frame that was allotted. During that time, Mike Huckabee from Iowa then called Christians to come and show their support for uh, Dan Cathy and his business for just one day by giving their patronage to the business um, because of its biblical stand. I want to read a quote from Barna's article. I actually have been getting on Barna's and following him, uh, America at a Crossroads. He wrote the, recently wrote the book, which I've read, but he's doing a, a show uh, every Tuesday, a video every Tuesday he puts out and writes some articles. Um, and this came from his article. He writes, but not all referring back to that call to support somebody in business who was taking a biblical stand. He wrote, but not all evangelical Christians were supportive of the, of the home of, of, of the chicken sandwich. In an article for World Magazine, Barnabas Piper, son of the prominent evangelical pastor John Piper, wrote this, or stated this, he wrote, I will not be attending Chick-fil-A's uh, Appreciation Day on Wednesday, and here's why. Convictions, especially biblical ones, will divide people. Think about that for a moment. Let's sink in. have some, some shock and awe going up here in the front. 
That is inevitable, he says, but not desirable. The separation of believers and unbelievers when it happens must be at least resort or an unavoidable result. Actions to the contrary, those that clearly promote an us-versus-them mentality, are often unhelpful. There is a time for Christians to engage in boycotting, such as when a business deals in obvious immoral areas or is clearly unethical in its methods. But as for a mass of Christians to descend upon Chick-fil-A, restaurants across the country tomorrow to support the leadership's view on this issue is, I believe, a bold mistake, end quote. Here's what George Barna had to reply in his article, and I quote, I was stupefied by these remarks. Piper is young and was, no doubt, well-intentioned here. But brother, if you can't be relied on to show up and order a combo meal in support of a company under attack for its commitment to Christian principles, when exactly can we count on you? This wasn't about the leadership's view on homosexuality. This was about the biblical view of marriage and society. Besides, Huckabee wasn't asking Piper or other Christians to, to die for their faith. He wasn't asking them to take to the streets and destroy property as protesters on the left have recently done in such places as Ferguson and Berkeley. He wasn't asking them to do nothing more than eat a chicken sandwich and some waffle fries for Jesus. Has any protest in history been easier or tastier? End quote. Um, I have in my notes where I got that on the Internet. We are in a place that we've never found ourselves in the church. I don't know. The church seems to be, by and large, indifferent to most of it, or at least silent. He has an article following that one on uh, titled Fear in the Pulpit. Now, pastors are in for not really dealing with issues and the excuses we give. And in the article, it talks about our motives and suggests, Barna suggests that we're more interested in numbers and the attaboys on our back. Now, now you know, I, I've never been there. And you know that, that this pastor um, deals with it. And you know that not everybody has liked it. And I would share with you that some have left because of it. It's just true, okay? But the Bible says what it says, and God says what he means, and he means what he says, and the, uh, my job is to share what he says. I'd like to take you to, the, the, to this gospel. I'd like to go over it, and then I would like to draw from it. This is a Sabbath day, so I, I suggest that it might be lunch. I use lunch because I like doing lunch with friends. Okay, but it could have been a dinner. could have been later in the day. I don't know. It uh, could have been a mid-meal dinner, but it doesn't matter. But the title is uh, um, Jesus for Lunch. It was a Sabbath day, and a certain leader of the Pharisees um, invited and had a big meal and invited all his friends, and he invited Jesus. And uh, he decided to have Jesus for lunch. And uh, people were watching closely there. And uh, as they were uh, as they were there eating, and um, there there came along somebody who I have a hunch was not invited. Uh, the scriptures in different versions say he had dropsy. 
Uh, some translations said that he had swelling of the legs. We've, we've had people who, who have those kind of issues. Um, some kind of a swelling. I guess that's what dropsy means if you're reading the, King, the old King's English. And um, Jesus was there, and he saw the man. He took note of the man, and he, uh, he said to the crowd that was there, probably looking at the Pharisee and probably motioned for the man to come over to him. And he, and he laid hands on him, and he prayed for him, and he healed him. And he asked the question, he said, uh, is it right to, is it, is it, is it fitting and, and okay to heal on the Sabbath? And everybody at this luncheon table was silent. The scripture says that he looked at the crowd and he asked the crowd, he said, uh, would you not help if your ox had fallen in a ditch on the Sabbath to get it out? And, or, or your donkey, and that you would get it out? Your animal, if you, would you not do this even though it was a Sabbath? And still the crowd was silent. As uh, as they were there, Jesus was paying attention. Guests were still coming, and as the guests were still filing, some of them still filing in. And, and of course, you got to understand that in that uh, culture, people came and they, you know, they didn't wear wristwatches. They didn't even own a wristwatch. They weren't invented by at that time, and so they tried to make it around the time. But but people were still coming in and. What Jesus paid attention to what was going on is there as people were coming in, they were kind of looking for the best seat in the house. And they were looking for the places of honor. And uh, he, he, he noticed them and he, he shared with them. He said, uh, he said to them, if you were invited uh, by someone to a wedding banquet, don't set down at a place of honor in case someone more important would come into the into the building and you would have to be asked to remove yourself to a place that wasn't that much honor he said instead it would be better for you if you came in if you came in and you look for the the, the least seat in the house with the less honor and you find that that seat, and he said, "Then if your if your host comes to you and says to you, please come and take this seat, which is a higher honor, and then you will truly be honored." But he said, "Don't try to elevate yourselves. But 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 put yourselves in places of least honor." And he goes on to talk to them about it, and they're they're there, and they're 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 figuring out that. Um, this luncheon is just this luncheon is just not quite as much fun as I really hoped it would be. Somebody in the crowd thought it would be really cool then to make this whole luncheon spiritual. And he said and he shouts out, he said, What a glorious day. This is not word for word, but it's in there, okay? How wonderful it would be to eat at the banquet table in the kingdom. That didn't set too well with the master. And so he begins to tell another story, and I want to pick up into that story. Um, I want to uh, pick up into that story. Um, With verse 15. Now one of those eating with him heard this and told him, How blessed is the person who will eat in the kingdom of God. And Jesus told him, A man gave a large banquet and invited many people. And when it was time for the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, Come, everything is now ready. Every single one of them began asking to be excused. The first one told him, I bought a field, and I need to go out and inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I bought five pairs of oxen. That's ten ox. And I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I recently got married, so I can't come. And so the servant went back and reported all this to the master. And then the master of the house became 
get this, angry. And he told his servants, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the towns and bring back the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you ordered has been done and there's still room. And then the master told the servant, go into the streets and the lanes and make the people come in so that my house may be full. Because I tell you, get this, and you know who he's talking to, the very ones that invited him to this luncheon. I tell you that none of those men who were invited will taste anything at my banquet. And there you have it. One thing we notice is is that many who thought they were actually um, who were thought that they were actually in missed what God actually wanted for them. I, I just I find it amazing to be at lunch with Jesus. He's busy talking about the issues and he's healing uh, a, a, a poor guy. They would rather talk about having the banquet in the kingdom and talk all about the God stuff and the cool stuff. And there they are, and they're missing the fact that they're in the presence of an almighty God who I would note has the power to heal. And the question keeps nagging me, because I think it's relevant to today and to the, to the church of our day, is how do religious people, I have in my notes godly people, but what I mean is people who are all about the stuff of God, miss it. How can you, how can you be a part of a miraculous healing and still not get it? How, how can you read the Bible and not understand, be in ministry and not understand Chick-fil-A's owner's position? How, how do we get there? I suggest to you there's five things that I want to share with you that I would like to share that, that I'd like to sh- suggest to you. I don't think Jesus was real popular that day at that lunch, do you? Do you honestly think that he was making himself a lot of friends? I have a hunch there was probably only one person who was really thrilled about that day. It was the guy who needed healing and who discovered that meeting with Jesus changed his life forever. Everybody else seemed to be in being chastised and not real comfortable, not really liking it. And I would suggest to you and I that if we're going to be believers in Jesus Christ, that we are not always going to be popular once in a while. I love it. Um, This church, you guys are like the coolest people to pastor. I honestly, honestly, I feel so loved, and you let me work ministry in such a wonderful, wonderful way, and I am enjoying the ministry. But it hasn't always been that way, and it may not always stay that way. And i got to tell you that not everybody likes what I do. Not everybody agrees with what I do. But what I want to suggest to you and, and I is that we need to understand that following what God says is not always popular. In fact, I'm pretty, cons- I'm pretty sure that it is unpopular because Jesus himself said that narrow is the road and few who will will, will travel it. He said wide and broad is the road that leads to destruction and everybody would rather be there. And for us to to stand up and to to, to try to be wishy-washy is just wrong. It's ungodly. And I'm greatly concerned because I know that pastors, that Barna is actually right, and that that there are a lot of pastors who think that we dare not touch these issues, who who, who think that our job is just to talk about the love of Jesus. I was, uh, I mentioned earlier that I was with Pastor Pena, uh, Santiago Pena, 
And, I, and I'd like to share a, just a, a segment of our conversation last Thursday. We were talking about ministry. Um, we're, we're both excited to help each other um, as we try to get each other's churches growing. Um, I told him that I find it hard not to call him Pastor Pete, but so I keep Pastor Pena, and he laughed, and uh, he caught me almost saying Pastor Pete. Um, he's a um, lovable guy. He really is. Linda and Terry have had him a part of your church, your former church, and uh, they had great things to say about him. I didn't know that when he and I had chatted. Uh, but we were there, and we were sat and waiting for him to go into his his appointment, and he needed, and it's a fun conversation because his English is okay, but his concept of some some of the things that we try to say is difficult, and he and he usually when we talk, I, there's a there's an interpreter there to make sure he's getting all the concepts, and he had an interpreter sitting there listening, and we were talking about ministry, and he said he said to me something that I understood since I've been in Rochester, but it's been part of ministry for some time now. He said, "We get visitors. You guys are going to relate to this, okay? And they come for a couple of weeks, but they don't stay." And he said to me in his broken English, he said, um, but, but I prayed about it, and I asked, I asked the Lord, he said, um, if I should change the way I preach. He says to me, and I, and I, and I so can relate, he says to me, he says, um, I, I love to preach on the love of Jesus. I tell people Jesus loves them. He says, Jesus loves you. He said, but, but I also tell them, but he's not happy with what you're doing. And he said, I, I prayed about if I should change that message because people weren't staying. He said, and God said to me, no. Too many churches are out there telling everybody that Jesus loves them, but nobody's bothering to tell us that he doesn't like what we do. And what he went to the cross for, for was so that he could change that issue about the things called sin that we do. Jesus loves you, but he doesn't like what you do, and so he gave his life on Calvary's cross to fix the problem so that we could be transformed into his likeness because what we do separates us from God until the blood of Jesus Christ covers our sins and washes away our iniquities, and then the power of Jesus Christ begins to transform our lives, and we're never the same. So, we won't be popular. Two, I would share with you that, that, and I, me included, we're easily derailed. We, we, we get, it's a problem in the church. We, we, at, at, at some workshops as pastors, we talk about it, how easy it is when, when somebody comes in and says, hey, I think we ought to be doing this ministry, we ought to be doing that ministry. And my job is to figure out what Jesus has asked us to do and find those three or four main ministries, and that's that. Because we can't do everything. We cannot even, we dare not, hear me, we dare not compete with Autumn Ridge. I didn't know how important it is, but I'm starting to figure it out early on when I got here is that we don't have a lot to offer, but we, let, we will offer as a church a place where you can come in and get busy for Jesus. And if you, don't, if you come to, to be a spectator, you're probably not going to like it here. And people are amazed who come in because I put them busy real quick. It doesn't take me real long to put you busy because that, that's a part of discipleship. Learning and working and growing. But we can get easily de de derailed, and it takes great intentionality to stay focused as a church. Did you notice that the host of the banquet was focused on his guest and not what was right in front of him? He was so busy focused on his guest, and, 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 and there was that man who needed, who, who needed uh, help right in front of him. And it was Jesus who understood what the real mission was. And the mission wasn't getting together for a great meal. There was a man there who needed attention. And Jesus didn't miss it. 
Let me move on. We won't be popular. We're easily derailed or distracted is another way to put it. One of the problems that we have in today's church that I am convinced of more and more as I do some studies is that we want inter- to be entertained. I have, um, and, the, and the praise team doesn't know this yet, but it's coming their way too. But Debbie certainly knows. I've been reading articles and forward into her and videos and forward into her. And we're, we're going to do some things that just, um, that just helps us actually to stay, keep us from being derailed by all the stuff. But because we're talking about lighting and, and remodeling, I've been, I've been doing a lot of research on lights and stage lights. And, John, we, we talked about we're going to put in some stage lights somewhere along the line to help up here because we need some help. But I don't think it's a new issue. I just think that it's getting out of hand today. Because I look at this luncheon with Jesus, and I, and, and I just want to, did you notice that there was a guy in the banquet who, who wanted to focus not, not just on the banquet that he was in, but on another banquet? We just want to keep going to banquets, you know? We just want to, we don't want to go to the old country buffet, man, and we want to have a, we, want, we just want to have a week of it. but not focus on those who needed to hear the good news. I am deeply troubled by what has been called worship wars. As I look and study worship a lot these days, and the direction, or rather misdirection, that the church has towards entertainment and away from what I would call worship and discipleship. You see, with entertainment, you show up and you observe. With discipleship, you engage and participate. Worship in many places has moved from us singing to God and moved into a concert. Music has become the focus, and preaching of the word takes a fatal second priority. I remember as a layman, some preacher saying something along the line, don't tell me what you think, tell me what God has to say. Don't tell me what you believe, tell me what God wants. As I've been doing this research, I can't tell you the number of, the many numbers of videos on how to set up stage lighting and how to set up just light boxes and pillars of lights, and just lights. I'm watching even in our own denomination, you know, young pastors putting, it's all about the lights. Is it? Really? I said to Terry what last week, I said, what, what I've seen take place in my 30 years, actually almost 40 years of, of doing ministry, both as a layman uh, in youth, and um, what we used to go to were called concerts. And what churches are trying, uh, a lot of the mega churches are trying to do is give that concert feel to their worship. And they're real close. And concerts aren't bad. In fact, I have groups come in, and we do concerts once in a while. I don't see them as evil. But when we go to church for a concert, do you understand? We're not discipling. We're being entertained. And that's really the different motive of, of, of between the two. One is for, is for entertainment. It's religious. It's Christian entertainment. And the other, the other, when we come in and we sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, we are exalting God. And there's a huge difference. Let me move on. That'll, that'll stick with you a while. Chew on it like a bone, okay? It, 
it's a problem particularly with young people. They, they want to go in and, they, you know, but, but, but if you were to turn off the singers up front and you were to listen, would they be singing? I, I, I'm not bashing young people, not bashing all churches, but I am saying that when you, when you have churches that focus on the numbers and focus on the entertainment side of things, we're getting off and we're not helping our people and the pastors aren't dealing with it. You didn't come here today to be entertained. At least I hope you didn't because if you did, you're disappointed. You most likely won't come back. Um, another thing that I noticed that Jesus picked on in that, that, that luncheon was we're too busy. This won't make me popular. But there is a lot and lots and lots of good and great excuses. It's probably one of Satan's favorite tools in his business. There's always something more legitimate and pressing needs that we don't have to, to go to church and we don't have to do, go to Bible studies. We don't have to, to do what God has asked us to do. We don't have to, to be in the obedience that God has called us because we've got all these legitimate excuses. And Jesus went down the list. He said, hey, I just bought some property. I can, I can get that. You don't buy property every day, but it's a reason not to be. Can't go to the banquet. Then there was the other guy. I got 10 ox, and I can't imagine me buying a new camera and not wanting to play with it right away. Or a new car and not want to drive it right away. Or a new whatever. <laughs> but God, God is concerned about all the excuses that we give. And, 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 and he's there. We're just too busy. And one of the things that I've struggled with in the past 15 to 20 years is how can I as a pastor communicate to my people to slow down and back up and do less? I, I, we don't have this issue here, but in my last church we had young families. We had lots of young families. And those children would run their parents ragged. And some of you have grandchildren and children with children, and, and they're running them ragged. They can't keep up. They need five cars to be in five different places with the larger families. No one says this word to their children. No. Why not? Because I said so. I'm getting thumbs up over here. <laughs> we are too busy, folks. I cannot keep up. Lastly, probably most important, I think there's another whole message coming on this. But for today, it's just a point with some scripture. Knowing that most people who go to church either want to, A, be entertained, or, B, have an experience, some, some kind of experience with God. Oh, that's cool. That was great. I got worked up. Instead of coming in and saying, I heard the word of God. Oh, help me, Lord. It's about his power. Church, hear me. I think the church has, has, has lost sight of the fact that it is about the power of God. Particularly for you and I, the power of God, the Spirit who lives in us. It's not about knowledge. It's not about enlightenment. It's not about how it felt at church. It's not about any of that. But it's about how God has the power to change our lives for the rest of our lives. And that's what it's about. Listen to Paul's prayer for the church there in Ephesus. Just, just a couple verses. I, I, I'll share them with you, but, but, I, but I'm, I'm taken by this. I, I thought about just making it the whole sermon about this. 
He writes this. He says, this is the reason I bow on my knees before the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, from whom every family in heaven and on earth receives its name. He says, I pray that he would give you according to his glorious riches strength in your inner being and power through his spirit. <laughs> And that the Messiah would make his home in your hearts through faith. Then having been rooted and grounded in love. Pastor Pena says, I tell them about the love of Jesus. And then I tell them that Jesus doesn't like what you're doing. Nobody wants to hear that what we're doing is sinful. Jesus didn't like what I'm doing. Let me read what Paul writes to the church in Corinthians. He writes, for the Messiah did not send me to baptize you. They, he, he, they, were, they were going on and on about who was doing the baptizing. And they wanted to know about Paul's authority and who he baptized. And, he, and this is his response to all of that. And the church is off track and derailed. And, and by the way, nothing's new today. And for the, he writes, for the Messiah did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent wisdom. It's not how well I preach. It's not how cool I am with my words. It's not the, the wordsmith that I am. He said, none of that. It's not my education. It's not my position. It's not any of that. <coughs> it's not eloquent wisdom. So the cross of the Messiah won't be emptied of its power. He writes, for the message about the cross is nonsense to those who are being destroyed, but it is God's power to us who are being saved. Hallelujah. I can think of, by the way, I can think of no greater demonstration of God's power than the transformed life. It isn't the healings that happen here. It, 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 th th those are wonderful. I love getting in services where God manifests in those kind of ways. I love being in services where people are slain in the Spirit. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I had Halle Boren. I don't see a uh, Halle Boren. Debbie would sing, and he's got his hanky, and he's walking up and down, crying and sobbing as, 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 as the Lord was touching him. I love being in those kind of services. I love seeing the power of God moving people. I love seeing people get worked up about Jesus and what he's done for them. But I'm telling you, those experiences pale in the comparison of God's, the Holy Spirit's power to change a life, to, to, to come in and move and stir that we are not the same man that I once was. Why? Because I've been born again. I have gone down as I was baptized into the water. I have raised up with Christ and I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. And the one thing the church seems to not be doing these days is discipling people and getting people to enjoy, listen to this, the disciplines. A lot of emphasis these days are on the lighting, making church as, as a set like you would for a concert with all the lights and smoke. The real work, the real work is to transform life. The real power, the power that God himself does is the Spirit moving in us and changing us and redirecting us and helping us and getting us over ourselves and helping and helping you and I to to realize the sin that needs to be eradicated and it's not a finished job until we get to heaven but always changing I will employ a lot of technology as we go through some of the changes to help me to teach and to keep your attention the best I can I understand that young people are visual. 
And so I'm going to employ the cameras. I'm going to do things to try to help that because that's how they learn. I understand that, that some of us here learn by listening. That's how we learned in school. I get that. I'm going to do that. I will tell stories. I will, I will do everything in my means that I might win some in every way that I can. But I promise you this, there will never be a time when we will perform for you. Do I, will I, and do I talk to my praise team about smiling? Well, ask them. I do. Do I talk to them about looking at their persona? Yes, I do. Boy, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Remember singing those songs, huh? If you're happy and you know it, say amen. You thought I was going to say stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, then your life ought to show it. You remember singing that? We are not here to entertain. We are here to entertain the concept that Christ came to change and save us. I first started hanging with the Hussers. Well, actually, they started hanging with me. I was taken by their comments that they can't believe they found a place where the Bible was still preached. Now, what makes this more interesting is, is you don't find in either one of them a critical spirit. In fact, Linda, you've been accused of, of thinking the best of everybody. <laughs> because she does. They don't have critical spirits. Yet they had actually given up the, on the idea of even finding a place where God was honored from the pulpit and the truth was told. Isn't that right? They stopped going to church. Not because they didn't love God, not because they didn't believe in the church. They just couldn't find a place. You see, it's not, a sim it's not enough to simply come and soak in what is offered. That's what they were doing at that luncheon. Whoa, and then you think this luncheon's great. Wait till we get to the one in the kingdom. Uh-huh. You see, if you just come in and soak what is offered, that's a spectator's posture. We must all engage and invite. And I see Jesus saying that. We must engage and we invite. That is a worshiper's posture. You cannot go out with Jesus for lunch and not be changed. It's impossible. 